Shoe Talk, Part Eight, 1969. Suddenly, a whole new cast of characters was wandering in and out of the office. Rising seats enabled me to hide more and more wraps. Most were ex runners and eccentrics, as only ex runners can be. But when it came to selling, they were all business because they were inspired by what we were trying to do and because they worked solely on commission. Two dollars appeared. They were burning up the road, hitting every high school and college trade, meet within a thousand mile radius, and their extraordinary efforts were boosting our numbers even more. With posted dollar one fifty thousand in sales in nineteen sixty eight and in nineteen sixty nine we were on our way to just under three hundred thousand dollars. Though Wallace was still breathing down my neck, hustling me to slow down and moaning about my lack of equity. I decided the blue ribbon was doing well enough to justify a salary for its founder. Right before my 31st birthday, I made the bold move. I quit Paul Estate and went full time at my company, paying myself a fairly generous $18,000 a year. Above all, I told myself the best reason for leaving Paul Estate was that I'd already gotten more out of the school, Tani, than I ever hoped. I got something out. Two. I just didn't know it at the time, nor did I dream how valuable it would prove to be. In my last weekend campus, walking through the halls, I noticed a group of young women standing around an easel. One of them was dubbing at a large canvas, and just as I passed, I heard her lamenting that she couldn't afford to take a class on oil painting. I stopped, admired the canvas. My company could use an artist, I said. What? She said. My company needs someone to do some advertising. Would you like to make some extra money? I still didn't see any bank for the buck in advertising, but I was starting to accept that I could no longer ignore it. The standard insurance company had just run a four-page ad in the Wall Street Journal, touting Blu-ray but as one of the dynamic young companies among its clients. The ad featured a photo of Bowman and me, staring at the shoe, not as if we were shoe innovators, more as if we'd never seen a shoe before. We looked like morons or was embarrassing. In some of our ads, the model was none other than Johnson. See Johnson rocking a blue track suit. See Johnson waving a javelin. When it came to advertising, our approach was from a top and spadash. We were making it up as we went along, learning on the fly, and it showed in one ad for the Tiger Marathon flight. I think we refer to the new fabric as Soch Fiber. To this day, none of us remembers who first came out with the word or what it meant, but it sounded good. People were telling me constantly that advertising was important, that advertising was next wave. I always rolled my eyes, but if Esky photos and made of words and Johnson who seductively on the couch was slipping into our aid. I needed to stop paying more attention. I'll give you two bucks an hour. I told the starving artist in the hallway at Poland State. To do what? She asked. Design printed. I said. Do some watering logos, maybe a few charts and graphs for presentations? It didn't sound like much of a gig, but the poor kid was desperate. She wrote her name on a piece of paper, Carolyn Davison, and her number. I shoved it in my pocket and forgot all about it. Hiring sales reps and graphic artists showed great optimism, and I didn't consider myself an optimist by nature. Not that I was a pessimist. I generally tried to hover between the two, committing to neither. But as 1969 approached, I found myself staring into space and thinking the future might be bright. After a good night's sleep, after a hearty breakfast, I could see plenty of reasons for hope. Aside from our robust and rising sales numbers, Onisuka will soon be beginning bringing out several exciting new models, including the Obori, which featured a feeder light nylon apple, also the marathon and other nylon with line sleek as a also the marathon and other nylon with line sleek as a common cheer. These shoes will set themselves a chill hotel many times, hanging them a chill hotel many times, hanging them on the cookboard. Also, Bowman was back from Mexico City, where he'd been an assistant coach on the U.S. Olympic team, meaning he'd played a pivotal role in the U.S., winning more gold medals than any team from any nation ever. My partner was more than famous; he was legendary. I phoned Bowman, eager to get 
his oral thoughts on the games and particularly on the moment for which they would forever be remembered the protests of john carlos and john Miss smith standing on the podium during the playing of the star spangled banner both men had bobbed their heads and raised black gloved fists a shocking gesture meant to call attention to racism poverty human rights builders they were still being condemned for it but bowman as i fully expected spotted them bowman supported all runners carlos and smith were shoeless during the protest they conspicuously removed their pyjamas and left them on the stand a child bowman i couldn't decide if this had been a cute thing or a bad thing for pyjama was all publicity really cute publicity was publicity like advertising a shimmer bowman chuckled and said he wasn't sure he told me about the scandalous behavior of perma and adidas throughout the games the world's two biggest athletic shoe companies run by two German brothers who despised each other had chased each other like keystone scopes around the olympics village joking for all the athletes huge sums of cash often stuffed in running shoe or manila envelopes were passed around one of puma sealed reps even got thrown in jail there were rumors that editors had framed him. He was married to a female sprinter, and Bowman choked that he'd only married her to secure her endorsement. Was it didn't stop at mere payouts. Pioma has smuggled truckloads of shoes into Mexico City, while Aditas cleverly managed to evade Mexico's stiff import tariff. I heard through the crappy wine they did it by making a nominal number of shoes at the factory. I heard through the crappy wine they did it by making a nominal number of shoes at a factory with Alajara. Powerman and I didn't feel morally offended. We felt left out. Blue Ribbon had no money for payouts and therefore no presents at the Kings. White had one miniature boat in the Olympic village and one guy walking it. Book. I didn't know if Book had been sitting there reading comic books or just hadn't been able to compete with the massive presence of Adidas and Puma. But Either way, his bot generated zero business, zero buzz. No one stopped by. Actually, one person did stop by. Actually, one person did stop by. They told me a brilliant American detective asked for some tigers so he could show the world that he couldn't be bought. But Bob didn't have the size, nor the right shoes for any of his events. Plenty of athletes were training in tigers, Bowman reported. We just didn't have anybody actually competing in them. Part of the reason was quality. Tigers just weren't good enough shop. The main reason, however, was money. We had not a penny for endorsement deals. We are not broke, at your bowman. We just don't have any money, he grunted. Either way, he said, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to pay athletes legally? Lastly, Bowman told me he'd bumped into Kitami at the Kings. He didn't much care for the man. Doesn't know a damn thing about shoes. Bowman crumbled and he's later to sleep, later to full of himself. I was starting to have the same inkling. I'd gotten a sense from Kitami's last few wives and letters that he might not be men. I'd gotten a sense from Kitami's last few wives and letters that he might not be men, he'd seen, and that he wasn't the fan of Blue Ribbon. He'd appear to be one I was less in Japan. I had bad feelings in my bones. Maybe he was getting ready to shake up our prices, I mentioned this to Bowman and told him I was taking Myers to protect us. Before hanging up, I boosted up. Though I didn't have enough cash or cash to pay at least, I did have enough to buy someone at Onisuka. I had a man on the inside. I said a man acting as my eyes and ears and keeping tabs on Kitami. He sent out a memo saying as much to all Blue Ribbon employees. By now, we had around 40. Though I had fallen in love with Japanese cultures, I kept my souvenir samurai sword beside my task. I also warned them that Japanese business practices were thoroughly perplexing. In Japan, you couldn't protect what either your competition or your partner might do. I'd given up trying. Instead, I wrote, I have taken what I think is a big step to keep us informed. I've hired a spy. He works full-time in the Onisuka export department. Without going into a lengthy discussion of why, I will just tell you that I feel he's trustworthy. The spy may seem somewhat unethical to you, but the spy system is ingrained and completely accepted in Japanese business circles. They actually have schools for industrial spies, much as we have schools for typists and stenographers. 
I can't imagine what made me use the word spy so much only, so badly, other than the fact that James Bond was all the rage just then. Nor can I understand why, when I was revealing so much, I didn't reveal the spy's name. It was Fujimoto, whose bicycle I'd replaced. I think I must have known, on some level, that the memo was a mistake, a terribly stupid thing to do, and that I would live to regret it. I think I knew, but I often found myself as perplexing as Japanese business practices. Kitami and Mr. Onisuka both attended the games in Mexico City and afterward they both flew to Los Angeles. I flew down from Oregon to meet them for Chino at the Japanese restaurant in Santa Monica. I was late, of course, and by the time I arrived they were full of sick, like schoolboys on holiday. Each was wearing a souvenir sombrero, like the warning. I tried hard to mirror their festive mood I made them shirt for shirt, had them finish off several platters of sushi and generally bonded with them both. At my hotel that night I went to bed thinking, hoping I'd been paranoid about Kitami. The next morning we all flew to Poland so they could meet the gang of Blue Ribbon. I realized that in my letters to Onisuka not to mention my conversation with them, I might have overlapped the grand hill of our worldwide headquarters. Sure enough, I saw Kitami's face drop as I walked in. I also saw Mr. Onisuka looking around, bewildered. I hastened to apologize. Emily looked small. I said, laughing tightly, what would you a lot of business out of this room? They looked at the broken windows, the juggling window closer, the way we play with room divider. They looked at Virtual in his wheelchair. They felt the walls vibrating from the pink bucket joke box. They looked at each other, dubious. I told myself, well, it's all over. Sensing my embarrassment, Mr. Onisuka put a reassuring hand on my shoulder. It was most charming, he said. On the far wall, Virgil had hung a large, handsome map of the United States, and he'd put a red washpin everywhere, which sold a pair of tigers in the last five years. The map was covered with red pushpens. For one merciful moment, it devoted attention from our office space. Then Kitami pointed at Eastern Montana. No pins, he said. Obviously, salesmen here not doing job. This one sushing by. I was trying to build a company and a marriage. Fanny and I were learning to live together, learning to melt our personalities and ideas in crisis, though we agreed that she was the one with all the personality and, and I was the idiosyncratic one. Therefore, it was she who had more to learn. For instance, she was learning that I spent a fair portion of each day losing in my own thought, tumbling down mental wormholes, trying to solve some problem or construct some plan. I often didn't hear what she said and if I did hear, I didn't remember it minutes later. She was learning that I was absent-minded, that I would drive to the grocery store and come home empty-handed without the one item she'd asked me to buy. Because all the way to you and all the way back, I had been puzzling over the latest bank crisis or the most recent Onisuka shipping delay. She was learning that I misplaced everything, especially the important things like wallet and keys bad enough that i couldn't multitask but i insisted on trying i'd often scan the financial pages while eating lunch and driving my new black cargo didn't remain new for long as the mr Mago of oregon i was forever bumping into trees and poles and other people's fandom she was learning that i wasn't housebroken i left the toilet seat up left my clothes where they fell left food on the counter i was effectively helpless I couldn't cook or clean or do even the simplest things for myself because I'd been spoiled rotten by my mother and sisters all those years in the servants' quarter. I'd essentially had servants. She was learning that I didn't like to lose at anything. The losing for me was a special form of agony. I often flippantly blamed power men, but it went way back. But it went way back. I told her about playing ping pong with my father when I was a boy and the pain of never being able to beat him. I told her that my father would sometime laugh when he won, which sent me into a rage. More than once, I'd thrown down my paddle 
and threat of crying. I wasn't proud of this behavior, but it was ingrained. It explained me. She didn't really get it until we went bowling. Penny was a very good bowler. She'd taken a bowling test at Oregon State. So I perceived this as a challenge, and I was going to meet the challenge head on. I was determined to win, and thus everything other than a strike made me clump. Above all, she was warning that marrying a man with a startup shoe company meant living on shoestring butter, and yet she tried. I could give her only $25 a week for groceries, and still she managed to whip off delicious meals. I gave her a credit card and a $2,000 limit to furnish our entire apartment. And she managed to buy a dining table, two chairs, a tiny TV, and a big couch with soft amps, perfect for napping. She also bought me a brown recliner, which is stuck in a corner of the living room. Now, each night, I could lean back at a 45-degree angle and spin inside my own head all I wanted. I was more comfortable and safer than the cougar. I got into the habit every night of phoning my father from my recliner. He'd always be in his recliner too, and together, recliner to recliner, we'd hash out the latest threat confronting Blue Ripper. He no longer saw my business as a waste of my time, apparently, though he didn't say too explicitly. He did seem to find the problems I faced interesting and challenging which amounted to the same thing. In the spring of 1969, Penny began to complain of feeling poorly in the mornings. Field didn't sit well. By midday, she was often a little wobbly around the office. She went to the doctor, the same doctor who delivered her, and discovered she was pregnant. We were both overjoyed, but we also faced a whole new learning curve. Our cozy apartment was now completely inappropriate. We'd have to buy a house, of course, but could we afford the house? I just started to pay myself a salary, and then which part of town should we buy? Where were the best schools, and how was I supposed to research real estate prices in schools? Plus, all the other things that go into buying a house. While running a startup company? Was it even feasible to run a startup company while starting a family? Should I go back to accounting? or teaching or something more stable. Leaning back in my recliner each night, starting at the ceiling, I tried to settle myself. I told myself, life is growth. You grow or you die. We found a house in Bewater, small, only 1,600 square feet, but it had an arc of land around it, and a little horse corral and a pool. There was also a huge pine tree in the front and a Japanese bamboo. Out back, I loved it. More. I recognized it. When I was growing up, my sisters asked me several times what my dream house would look like. And one day, they handed me a charcoal pencil and a pad and made me draw it. After panning and they moved in, my sisters dug out the old charcoal sketch. It was an exact picture of the Bewatching house. The price was $34,000 and I popped my shirt buttons to discover that they had 20% of that in savings. On the other hand, I had pledged those savings against my money loans at First National. So I went down to talk to Harry White. I need the savings for a down payment on a house. I said, but I'll pledge the house. Okay, he said. On this one, we don't have to consult Wallace. That night, I told Penny that if we ribbon, we'd lose the house. She put her hand on her stomach and sat down. This was the kind of insecurity she'd always worked to avoid. Okay, she kept saying. Okay. With so much at stake, she felt compelled to keep working for Blue Ribbon. Right through her pregnancy, she would sacrifice everything to Blue Ribbon. Even her cheap boy had gold of graduating from college, and when she wasn't physically in the office, she would run a meal order business out of the new house. In 1969, alone, despite morning sickness, swollen ankles, weight gain, and constant fatigue, Penny get out 1500 orders. Some of the others were nothing more than crude tracings of a human food sent in by customers in far-flung places. But Penny didn't kill. She dutifully matched the tracing to the correct shoe and filled the order. Every sale counted. At the same time that my family outgrew its home, so did my business. One room beside the pink bucket no longer contained us. One room beside the pink bucket 
could no longer contain us. Also, Wotel and I were tired of shouting to be heard about the jukebox. So each night, after work, I would go out of cheeseburgers, then drive around looking at office space. Logistically, it was nightmare. Wotel had to try it because this wheelchair wouldn't fit in my cargo, and I always felt guilty and uncomfortable being shuffled by a man with so many limitations. I also felt crazed with nerves because many of the offices we looked at were up a flight of stairs or several flights. This man I'd have to wheel Woodall up and down. At such moments, I was reminded painfully of his reality. During a typical workday, Woodall was so positive, so energetic, it was easy to forget. But within him, many were in him. Upstairs, downstairs, I was repeatedly struck by how delicate, how helpless he could be. I'd pray under my breath, please don't let me drop him, please don't let me drop him. Virtual heard me, would tense up, and his tension would make me more nervous. Relax, I'd say, I haven't lost a patient yet, haha. <laughs> no matter what happened, he'd never lose his composure, even at this most vulnerable, with me balancing him precariously at the top of some chalk flight of stairs. He never lose touch with his essential philosophy. Don't you dare feel sorry for me. I'm here to call you. The first time I ever sent him to trade show, the only lost his wheelchair, and when they found it, the frame was bent like a pretzel. No problem. In it, mutuality chill. Votrell attended the show, ticket off every item on his to-do list, and came home with an ear-to-ear, mission-accomplished smile on his face. At the end of each night, Search for new office space, Wojtel and I would always have a big belly laugh about the whole debacle. Most nights we'd went up at some type bar, godly almost delirious. Before Barton, we'd often play a game. I'd print out a stopwatch and we'd see how fast Wojtel could fold up his wheelchair and get it and himself into his car. As a farmer, as a former track star, he left the challenge of a stopwatch of trying to beat his personal best. His record was 44 seconds. We both cherished those nights, the silliness, the sense of shared missions, and we mutually ranked them among the solid gold memories of our young lives. Virgil and I were very different, and yet our friendship was based on the same approach to work. Each of us found pleasure, whenever possible, in focusing on one small task. One task, we often said, clears the mind, and each of us recognized that this small task of finding a bigger office man, we were succeeding. We were making a go of this thing called Blue Ribbon. We spoke to a deep desire in each of us to win, or at least not lose. Though neither of us was much of a talker, we brought out a chatty speech in each other. Those nights we discussed everything, opened up to each other with unusual candor, which I'll show me in detail about his shirt, about his injury. If I was ever tempted to take myself too seriously, which his story always reminded me that things could be worse, and the way he handled himself was a constant bracing lesson in the virtue and value of good spirit. His injury wasn't typical, he said, and it wasn't total. He still had some feeling, still had hopes of marrying, having a family. He also had hopes of a cure. He was talking an experimental new drug, which had shown promising pleasures. Trouble was, it had trouble was it had a garlicky aroma. Some nights on our office hunting expeditions, Virgil would smell like an old school pizzeria, and I let him her about. I asked Virgil if he was. I hesitated, fearing I had no right. Happy, he gave it some thought. Yes, he said he was. He loved his work. He loved blurry, but though he sometimes crazed at the irony. A man who can't walk paddling shoes. Not sure what to say to this. I said nothing. Often Penny and I would have Rachel over to the new house for dinner. He was like family. We loved him, but we also knew we were filling a void in his life, a need for company and domestic comfort. So Penny always wanted to cook something special when Rachel came over, and the most special thing she could think of was coming Scottish game hand plus a dazzled made from brandy and ash milk. She got the recipe from a magazine, which left us all brutal. Though, hence and brandy put a serious dent in her twenty-five jolly crossery pattern. Penny simply couldn't couldn't economize when it came to Wojo. If I told her that Wojo was coming to dinner, 
she threw flecks away. Gosh, I'll get some capons and brandy. I was more than once to be hospitable. She was fattening him up. She was nurturing him. Virgil, I think, spoke to her new activated maternal streak. I struggle to remember. I close my eyes and think big. But so many precious moments from those nights are gone forever. Numberless conversations, breathless laughing fits, declarations, revelations, confidences, they've all fallen into the sofa cushions of time. I remember only that we always sat up half the night, cataloging the past, mapping out the future. I remember that we took turns describing what our little company was and what it might be and what it must never be. How I wish on just one of those nights I had a tape recorder or kept a journal as I did on my trip around the world. Still, at least I can always call to mind the image of Virgil seated at the head of our dinner, carefully dressed in his blue jeans, his trademark v-neck sweater over a white tee, and always on his feet a pair of tigers, the rubber soles first time. By then he'd grown a long beard and a bushy moustache, both of which I envied. Heck, it was the 60s, I'd have had a beard down to my chin, but I was constantly needing to go to the bank and ask for money. I couldn't walk like a bum. When I presented myself to others, a clean shave was one of my few concessions to the man. Virgil and I eventually found a promising office in Tiger, south of downtown Poland. It wasn't a whole office building, we couldn't afford that, but a corner of one floor, the rest was occupied by the Horace Mann Insurance Company. Inviting almost posh, it was a dramatic stop, and yet I hesitated. There had been a curious logic in our next door to a honky tonk, but an insurance company with carpeted halls and water coolers and many chores suits. The atmosphere was so buttoned down, so corporate. Our surroundings, I felt, had much to do with our spirit, and our spirit was a big part of our success, and I worried how our spirit might change if it was suddenly sure in space with a bunch of organization, men and automatons. I took to my recliner, gave it some thought, and decided a corporate way might be asymmetrical, contrary to our core beliefs, but it might also be just a thing with our bank. Maybe when Wallace saw our boring, sterile, new office space, he treated us with respect. Also, the office was in Tigard. Selling tigers out of tiger. Maybe it was meant to be. Then he thought about Woodall. He said he was happy at Blue Ribbon, but he'd mentioned the irony. Maybe it was more than ironic, sending him out to high schools and colleges to sell tigers out of his car. Maybe it was torture, and maybe it was a poor use of his talent. What suited Woodall best was bringing order to Charles, problem solving, one small task. After he and I went together to sign the tiger lease, I asked him if he'd like to change jobs, become operation manager for Blue Ribbon. No more sales calls, no more schools. Instead, he'd be in charge of dealing with all the things for which I didn't have the time and patience, like talking to Bob in LA, or corresponding with Johnson in Wellesley, or opening a new office in Miami or hiring someone to coordinate all the new sales reps and organize their report, reports, or approving expense accounts. Best of all, Wachel would have to oversee the person who monitored company bank accounts. Now, if he didn't cash his own paycheck, he'd have to explain the coverage to his boss himself. Bemin, Wachel said he liked the sound of that very much. He reached out his hand. Jill, he said, still had a grip of an athlete. Penny went to the doctor in September 1969. A checkup. The doctor said everything looked fine, but the baby was taking its time. Probably another week, he said. The rest of the afternoon, Penny spent at Blue Ribbon, helping customers. We went home together at an early dinner, turned in early about 4 a.m. She just told me. I don't feel so good, she said. I phoned the doctor and told him to meet us at Emmanuel Hospital. In the weeks before Labor Day, I'd made several practice trips to the hospital, and it was a good thing. Because now, game time, I was such a right dad. Holland looked to me like Bangkok. Everything was strange, unfamiliar. I drove slowly to make sure of each turn. Not too slowly, 
I scolded myself. You'll have to deliver the babies yourself. The streets were all empty. The lights were all green. A soft rain was falling. The only sounds in the car were panties heavy breathed and the wipers squeaking across the windshield. As he pulled up to the entrance of the emergency room, as he had Fanny into the hospital, she kept swaying. We are probably overacting. I don't think it's time yet. Still, she was breathing the way I used to breathe in the final lap. I remember the nurse taking Fanny from me, helping her into a wheelchair, rolling her down a hall. I followed along, trying to help. I had a pregnancy kit. I packed myself with a stopwatch, the same one I'd used to time with her. I now took Fanny's contractions aloud. Five, four, three. She stopped batting and turned to me. Through clenched teeth, she said, Stop doing that. And let's now helped her out of the wheelchair and onto a gurney and rolled her away. I stumbled back down the hall into something the hospital called the bopping. We are expectant fathers were expected to sit and stare into space. I would have been in the delivery room or with Penny, but my father had warned me against it. He told me that I'd been born rightfully which scared the jailites out of him and therefore cautioned me at the decisive moment be somewhere else. I sat in a hot plastic chair, eyes closed, doing she walk in my mind. After an hour, I opened my eyes and I saw, and saw our doctor standing before me. Beads of sweat glistened on his forehead. He was saying something. That is, his lips were moving, but I couldn't hear. Let's Troy? Here's the toy. Are you Roy? He said it again. It's a boy. Uh, a, a boy? Really? You wife, she just pumped Trump. Who was saying she didn't complain once and she pushed at all the right time. Has she taken many women's classes? Lemons, I said. Pardon? What? Well, I'm like an invalid town a long hall and into a small room. There behind the curtain was my wife, exhausted, radiant, her face bright red. Her arms were wrapped around a quilted white blanket decorated with blue baby carriages. I pushed back a corner of the blanket to roll with a hat the size of a ripe grapefruit, a white stocking cap pushed on top. My boy, he looked like a traveler, which of course he was. He just began his own trip around the world. I leaned down, kissed Fanny's cheek. I pushed away her damp heel. You are a champion, I whispered. She squinted, uncertain. She thought. I was talking to the baby. She handed me my son. I called him in my arms. I cradled him in my arms. He was so alive. A so child kid. So helpless. The feeling was wondrous. Different from all other feelings. Though, familiar, too. Please don't let me drop him. A blue ribbon. I spent so much time talking about quality control, about craftsmanship, about delivery. But this, I realized, this was the real thing. We made this. I said to Penny, we made this. She nodded, then lay back. I handed the baby to the nurse and told Penny to sleep. I floated out of the hospital and down to the cow. I felt too sudden and overpowered need to see my father. I hung up for my father. I drove to his newspaper, packed several blocks away. I wanted to walk. The rain had, the rain had stopped. The air was cool and damp. I dug into a cigar store. I pictured myself handing my father a big fat robusto and saying, Hey, uh, Grandpa, coming out of the store, the wooden cigar box under my arm. I bumped straight into Kate Foreman, a former rather at Oregon. Kate, I cried. Hey, uh, Buck, he said. I grabbed him by the lapels and shouted, It's a boy. He leaned away, confused. He thought I was drunk. There wasn't time to explain. I kept walking. Foreman had been on the famous Oregon team that set the world record in the four-mile rally. As a runner, as an accountant, I always remember the stunning time. A star on Bowman's 1962 national championship team, Foreman had also been the fifth American ever to break the four-minute mile. And to think, I told myself only hours ago, I thought those things made me a champion. So, the villain skies of November settled in low. I wore heavy sweaters and sat by the fireplace and did a sort of self-inventory. I was all stocked up the gratitude. Penny and my new son, whom we had named Matthew, were heavily, were healthy. Buck and Woodall and Johnson were happy. 
sales continued to rise. Then came the mail. A letter from Bob. After returning from Mexico City, he was suffering some sort of Montezuma's revenge. He had problems with me. He told me in the letter he didn't like my management style. He didn't like my vision for the company. He didn't like what I was paying him. He didn't understand why I took weeks to answer his letters and sometimes he didn't answer at all. He had ideas about shoe design and he didn't like how they were being ignored. After several pages of all this, he demanded immediate changes plus a raise. My second mutiny, this was, this one, however, was more complicated than Johnson's. I spent several days drafting my reply. I agreed to raise his salary slightly and then I put rank. I reminded Bob that in my company, there could only be one boss and sorry for him, the boss of Blue Ribbon was, was Buck Knight. I told him if he wasn't happy with me or my management style, he should know that quitting and being fired were both viable options. As with my spy memo, I suffered instant writer's remorse. The moment I dropped it in the mail, I realized that Buck was a valuable part of the team, that I couldn't afford to lose him. I dispatched our new operation manager, Virgil, to Los Angeles to patch things, to patch things up. To patch things up. Virgil took Bob to lunch and tried to explain that I wasn't sleeping much with a new baby and all. Also, Virgil told him I was feeling tremendous stress after the visit from Kitami and Mr. Onisuka. Virgil talked about my unique management style, telling Paul that everyone bitched about it. Everyone pulled their hair out about my non-responses to their mammals and larvas. In all, Virgil spent a few days with Bob, something his feeders going over the operation. He discovered that Bob was fresh too, though the retail store was thriving. The back room, which had basically become our national warehouse, was in shambles, boxes everywhere, invoices and papers taped to the ceiling. Bob couldn't keep pace. When Virgil returned, he gave me the picture. I think box back in the fold, he said, but we need to relieve him of that warehouse. We need to transfer all warehouse operations up here. Moreover, he added, we needed to hire Virgil's mother to run it. She'd worked for years in the warehouse at, at Jansen, the legendary Oregon outfitter, so it wasn't nepotism, he said. Ma Virgil was perfect for the job. I wasn't sure. I killed. If Virgil was good with it, I was good with it. Plus, the way I saw it, the more Virgil, the better.